Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is the taking of the oath by our new member. I now invite Alex Rowley to take the oath. Would you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, Alexander Andrew Penman Rowley. I, Alexander Andrew Penman Rowley. Do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance. Do swear that I will be faithful and be, bear true allegiance. To Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law. To Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. So help me God. The next item of business is portfolio of questions. Question number one, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the impact of UK Government welfare reforms on health and wellbeing in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has serious concerns about the impact of the health and wellbeing of those negatively affected by the UK Government's welfare benefit reforms. In 2012, the Scottish Public Health Network undertook a review of literature which suggests that there are likely to be negative health outcomes in both the short and the long term as a consequence of these reforms, although it is not possible at this stage to quantify these. In December 2013, the Scottish Public Health Observatory published a report on a framework and baseline measures for the evaluation of the health and health inequalities impact of the current wave of welfare changes and the current economic downturn. Although it is too soon to evaluate the impacts of either the economic recession or welfare changes using routine health data, the report will be updated in due course when more data are available. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree with me that it is clear that these reforms are having an adverse effect on people across Scotland, including many young people? And does he share with me concerns that both the coalition forums and Labour's recent threats to remove benefits from under 25s can only add to the pressure on our young people? And not only with independence can we assure Scotland's young people that they will have a government committed to life being better, fairer and healthier for them all. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I entirely agree with what the member says. And of course, the situation will get much worse if the Tories win the next UK election and there is a no vote in Scotland. We will have our share of £25 billion worth of cuts, £12 billion of which will be in welfare, a size of cuts which has now been endorsed by the Labour Party. Neil Findlay. Uh, the bedroom tax is one uh, reform that is having a real impact on the health and well-being of people. Will uh, the Cabinet Secretary therefore support Jackie Bailey's bill that will help these people? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, as, the, as the member knows, we have done absolutely everything within our power to help people who are the Order. victims of the bedroom tax. I would remind the member it was a Labour government who introduced the bedroom tax in the private rented sector. And really, they cannot complain when the Tories copy them and extend the policy to another sector. The last people who should be complaining are the people who introduced the policy in the first place. We are the only party that has consistently opposed the bedroom tax. And unlike some Labour MPs, our people were there to vote against it. Question number two in the name of Ken McIntosh has not been lodged. The member has not provided an explanation. Question number three, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making on introducing its proposed legislation on carers. Minister Michael Martin. Uh, further to the First Minister's announcement last October about the Scottish Government's intention to bring forward legislation, we published our consultation paper on carers legislation on the 22nd of January. This consultation period will run until the 16th of April 2014. The consultation paper sets out our proposals to build on achievements to date 
to help ensure more consistent and sustainable support to improve outcomes for carers and young carers across Scotland. We look forward to receiving responses from carers and young carers and from the statutory and voluntary sector across the country. Graham Day. I thank the Minister for that response and very much welcome the prominence given to young carers and their role throughout the consultation document. But can I ask him how the Government will seek to ensure the voice of young carers is heard as we look to shape future legislation? Because, as he knows, young carers encounter very specific issues and challenges in their role, and I am certain that, like me, he would want to seize the opportunity that the consultation presents to set about tackling some of these. Minister. Uh, I recognise the point that the member is making. As he correctly states, within the actual consultation document, it is very clearly set out the importance of making sure that we provide the right type of support to uh, young carers and the opportunities that that affords uh, through the provision of uh, additional legislation in this area. Uh, my officials have already met with um, a range of the stakeholders, including the national carers' organisations, uh, and will be looking to make sure that we have the uh, document circulated widely uh, through the Scottish uh, Young Carers Service Alliance uh, and their stakeholders who work with young carers across the uh, country. Alongside that, uh, we will be looking to look at how we can make sure that young carers have an opportunity to take part in any consultation events which are uh, taking place across the country, so we can make sure that we get uh, access to both young carers' views uh, for those who are uh, under the age of 18 and also for those uh, young carers uh, who are between 18 and 25. It is absolutely crucial that we hear their voices in the course of this consultation exercise and we work with stakeholders to make sure that that happens effectively. Uda Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware of the Scottish Youth Parliament campaign, uh, Care F Fair Share for Young Carers. Will he make sure that they are consulted as part of uh, the process and that their views are fed in, because their, their campaign is great for highlighting actually the needs of young carers with education, help at home and the like. And I think it is a very useful campaign and it will be helpful if the Minister would see fit to include them as much as possible in this process. Minister. Um, I am, of course, aware of the uh, Scottish, Youth, Scottish Youth Parliament's uh, work in this area and uh, provided with them some support for their event last week. Uh, and I am very conscious of the issues that they have raised, and I can give a member assurance that they have an opportunity to feed into the consultation exercise, uh, as will many other organisations across the country. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As, as Rhoda Grant and, and the Minister have already said, that was an excellent event on Friday. And indeed, the campaign by the Scottish Youth Parliament is an absolutely excellent campaign. There was one element of the action they're looking for, though, that surprised me because I hadn't realised this was an issue, which is the anomalies in the administration of the educational maintenance allowance which can result in many young carers losing their EMA entitlement. And I wonder if the Minister um, would undertake to meet with the Cabinet Secretary for Education fairly quickly to discuss this particular issue. Minister. Um, can I say to the member, uh, this is an issue which um, uh, we are already aware of uh, and we have taken some uh, action uh, around this. Uh, officials have met with the uh, Scottish Young Carers Service Alliance and with the colleges uh, development Network, uh, and we are undertaking a range of actions around some of the difficulties that young carers have around uh, access to education uh, maintenance uh, allowances. Uh, one of the things that we are presently doing is revising the Scottish Government guidance uh, on EMAs to make sure that they include uh, information uh, which can help to support carers and to recognise some of the unique challenges that young carers may have. We are also looking to provide additional information in the school packs, uh, which are presently being finalised uh, before they are distributed to schools around EMAs, uh, and also how we can uh, provide further information to young carers about the uh, provisions within uh, the EMA uh, guidance. But I do recognise the, the concerns that have been raised, and some of the work that we are taking forward uh, is aimed at trying to address some of these concerns. And I will, of course, uh, be more than happy to discuss this with the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education to make sure we build on what we have achieved and also what we can do to improve things further in the future. Question four, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made on implementing the National Infertility Group report. Minister. Uh, new access criteria recommended in the report of the National Infertility Group, uh, with some modifications, were given to NHS boards on the 15th of May 2013 and have been in place since the 1st of July 2013. This means that for the first time ever, uh, criteria for NHS IVF 
are the same regardless of where couples live in Scotland. We are committed to providing an equitable and sustainable service across Scotland, which is why we have a maximum waiting time in place of 12 months for IVF by March 2015. This is the first time uh, a government in Scotland has made such a commitment. It's also the first time uh, the government has made uh, investment of funding specifically to reduce IVF uh, waiting times. Uh, we have today invested some £6 million with a further £6 million to be invested in 2014-15. This investment has made a dramatic impact on reducing waiting times for IVF treatment in all areas across Scotland. And I'm pleased to say uh, that waiting times are now currently at or below 12 months in the vast majority of areas across Scotland. In particular, waiting times in NHS Fife, NHS Fort Valley and NHS Grampian have fallen from over three years to between six and nine months. And I'm sure the member will recognise that that's good progress in improving this service. Thanks, uh, I thank the Minister very much for that reply. Indeed, it is very good progress uh, in working along with the NIG. They have achieved this. Uh, the Minister will also be aware that the NIG recommended that the number of IVF cycles be reviewed at the earliest possible opportunity. And as the Minister has said, with the monies coming from the Scottish Government investing in reducing waiting times, this is achieving a positive result. Can you give us a time scale as to when this review about the IVF cycles will be carried out? Minister. The uh, member is correct to point out that the National Infertility Group did recommend that there should be a review of the access criteria after a period of time, uh, and we're already undertaking some work to look at the new treatment pathways and also uh, to establish whether there is sufficient data to allow us to undertake the review at an earlier stage, because the review was initially intended to take place in 2015. Uh, my officials have already uh, met uh, this month with the Information Services Division, uh, with representatives from the four NHS IVF uh, centres uh, in Scotland and with the uh, patient stakeholders groups such as Infertility Network Scotland to consider whether we have uh, sufficient robust data to allow uh, an early review to take place. A further meeting will take place next month uh, to consider this in more detail. Uh, and if there is uh, sufficient robust data available, um, uh, the Scottish Government is content for that review to take place and for the review uh, to submit its view, uh, views to the uh, Scottish Government by the end of this year. Annette Milne. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand from the Infertility Network that NICE guidelines state that three attempts at IVF can be made available to patients under the NHS. In Scotland, I believe that only two are now being recommended, if I'm correct in that assumption. Can the Minister provide clarity as to how this recommendation has been reached and whether it has been made on clinical or on other grounds? Anissa. Um, the member is correct that it's, uh, the National Infertility Group uh, recommended to the Scottish Government that two cycles should be made available. Uh, she's correct to point out that there is a different position in England with three cycles. However, that's nice guidance, uh, not what's actually been implemented by the NHS in England. So, for example, uh, in the commissioning areas within uh, the NHS in England, uh, some 73% of those commissioning groups actually recommend less than three cycles. Uh, so it would be wrong to suggest that in England it is universally provided uh, on a, a three-cycle basis. However, uh, part of the review is to consider whether there is the possibility of providing further cycles within NHS in Scotland once we have achieved uh, the 12-month waiting period. And the review will assist us in considering whether that is something that can be achieved with the existing service delivery and with the, 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 the existing staff complement and with the existing resources in order to increase capacity further. Before I call Duncan McNeill, can I just take this opportunity just to record um, the work that our late and loved colleague Helen Eady did on this whole issue, particularly in Fife. Duncan McNeill. Thank you. Um, it was good the presiding officer to mention that, particularly when, when, the, when, when the, the minister mentioned the progress that's already been made in Fife and indeed in other areas. We, we heard from the Fertility Network last week, some of us who took time to meet them about, about the issue of the cycles, but we also heard that while there is very good progress taking place uh, across Scotland, one of the areas where progress is very slow is one of the biggest uh, health, health authorities, authorities in Scotland, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Now, I'm out on the limb here, but the may, Minister may be able to confirm, confirm it uh, today that I'm sure that we, it was reported to us last week that the waiting times in Glasgow 
Greater Glasgow and Clyde are somewhere around 22 months. Is this the case? And if it is the case, what can the Minister do to ensure that they catch up with the rest of Scotland? Minister. Um, there are uh, a couple of boards, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is one of them that is still not meeting the 12-month uh, target, um, uh, which was set uh, nationally. As it stands at the present time, the assisted conception unit in uh, Glasgow Infirmary currently has a 19-month uh, waiting period. Uh, patients um, have been offered the opportunity to have uh, services provided in other health board areas, whether it be Dundee, uh, Aberdeen or Edinburgh, to assist them. And there is additional capacity, uh, particularly in NHS Lothian, to assist them in meeting uh, uh, their uh, time frame. They are taking forward a considerable amount of work in order to make sure that they do comply uh, with the 12-month target. But for those patients who have uh, unfortunately had to wait for a longer period of time, they are being offered alternative uh, options in other health board areas in order to speed up access to treatment. Question number five, David Sh <clears throat> uh, To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with the NHS about the progress of the Diabetes Action Plan. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is in regular dialogue with NHS boards regarding the delivery of action in the Diabetes Action Plan. Uh, the NHS boards, Diabetes Managed Clinical Networks, uh, have each provided a comprehensive report to the Scottish Diabetes Group. Uh, overall, good progress has been made and boards are on track to meet the vast majority of the actions uh, for which they are responsible. A summary of the reports will be published on the Diabetes in Scotland website in April. David Shute. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be well aware that nearly one million people in Scotland are directly affected by diabetes by either having it or who are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes. How will people with diabetes be at the heart of the new diabetes action plan? And does the Minister share my view that we have to urgently tackle the ticking time bomb of diabetes in Scotland? Minister. Well, I think the member raises a, a very important point because there are a couple of aspects to this. One is the need to make, forward, make sure we take forward a, a range of actions to reduce the chances and the risks of individuals developing, particularly type 2 uh, diabetes. And we have a, a range of programmes that we take, through, take forward through our obesity route map in order to help to reduce the risk of an individual developing uh, diabetes in the first place, but also to make sure that those who are diabetic, that they get the best possible service. And the action plan, which I know the member is well aware of, uh, was aimed at ensuring that they were receiving the right type of services and the right quality of services within their own individual health board area. As I've mentioned, good progress has been made in that. And of course, we're now evaluating its impact and that will help to inform the next step that we have to take as part of uh, the second phase of the action plan. And I've got no doubt that the cross-party group will wish to feed into that process once we've started that activity to make sure that the next action plan allows us to build on that good progress and to continue to make the good progress we have been making. Question number six, Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish, uh, the Scottish Government what its position is on the establishment of a voluntary register of interest for doctors. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, whilst the regulation of medical doctors is reserved to the UK Government, healthcare professionals subject to statutory regulation are required to adhere to standards of ethical and professional conduct set by the regulatory bodies, whether they're working within NHS Scotland or in the private sector. Registered doctors are required by the General Medical Council to work to the standards in good medical practice, and since the introduction of the new General Medical Services contract in April 2004, general practices are contractually obliged to keep a register of gifts which have an individual value of more than £100. Adam Ingram. I thank uh, the Minister for, for his answer, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree that doctors should register gifts and payments they receive from drugs companies in a more formal way, similar to the way MSPs have to register our interests? As a recent letter to the British Medical Journal from a campaigning group of health pro professionals suggests, this would allow patients to check as a matter of routine if the doctor is benefiting financially from the ph pharmaceutical industry? And does he agree there is potential here for prescribing practices to be affected by such financial interests? Cabinet Secretary. 
The presiding officer has referred to in my answer, this is a reserved issue for the UK Government. However, while I, I agree that doctors should register gifts and payments they receive from drugs companies, this of course would require full and proper investigation. However, I do believe that anyone who has any uh, suspicions or concerns or evidence that uh, prescribing is being influenced by such gifts, they should report the matter to the right authorities. Question number seven, Jean Arcar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what use it makes of academic research from Scottish universities and colleges in formulating health and wellbeing policy. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding, Presiding Officer, many of the outputs of clinical research are universal and therefore research from academic sources from both within and out West Scotland is of value in formulating the Scottish Government's health and wellbeing policy. The Chief Scientist's Office, through its two research funding committees, funds high-quality peer-reviewed research of relevance to the health and well-being of the people of Scotland. Lay summaries of the outputs of this research are made available to Scottish Government health policy colleagues. More generally, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, SIGN, develops evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for the National Health Service in Scotland. SIGN guidelines are derived from a systematic review of all the scientific literature available. Jean Arkar. I think, thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Um, a, a few years ago, through the University of the Highlands and Islands, there, there were uh, a couple of doctors who had a three-year period of research into um, health for older, health and well-being and older people across the Highlands and Islands. And the net result of that, I think, has been a very positive one in various uh, communities. And I just wonder, uh, my understanding also is that the um, about 11% of university research, and I, and I have to say at this point that this is uh, my belief, I, I don't have evidence of this, but I understand that about... 11% uh, of the research in this field uh, that's done by universities is used by Scottish Government. That leaves um, almost 90% not being recognised. And I, I wonder if um, you feel, Cabinet Secretary, that there is room to make more use of some of, perhaps some of the experience of, of the health boards using uh, research generally across the country. Cabinet Secretary. Can I say, Presiding Officer, we make very extensive use and heavy involvement of medical professionals within our health boards in all the scientific work we do. Let me just give one example in relation to the science of informatics, which has been very important in informing our policy in diabetes. As a result of the involvement of the health boards and their medics in informatics and looking at how we can better treat diabetes, in recent years we've seen a 40% reduction in amputation in Scotland resulting from diabetes and a very, very substantial reduction in blindness resulting from diabetes. And that's a direct result of the application of the science of informatics throughout the health service in Scotland in cooperation with the CSO. Question number eight, Marco Biaggi. To ask the Scottish Government how it would use policy levers in an independent Scotland to increase life expectancy. Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, an independent Scotland would have at its disposal the full range of policy levers to promote good health and increase life expectancy. As well as maintaining free healthcare delivery through our National Health Service, independence will allow us to take responsibility for our society's well-being and welfare. An independent Scotland will have greater powers to regulate alcohol and tobacco through taxation, whilst control over tax policy and advertising regulation will help us achieve a coherent approach to the problems of obesity and poor diet. Most importantly, with independence, Scotland can address the poverty and socio-economic inequalities at the root of preventable ill health, which successive Westminster governments have systematically failed to tackle. Mark Biaggi. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. To what extent does he attribute our relatively poorer life expectancy to uh, economic inequality and, other, and how much to behavioural factors distinct to Scotland, such as the drinking culture? What is the relative weight between them? 
Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the international research led by uh, Professor Harry Burns, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, unfortunately about to move on to pastures new, but there is now overwhelming evidence that the major contributing factor to the disparity in life, uh, life expectancy within Scotland, as well as between the likes of Glasgow and other similar cities elsewhere, is almost entirely due to the levels of poverty, deep-seated poverty and unemployment in these cities. And uh, like Harry Burns, I believe that we will only reduce entirely the health inequalities when we're able to reduce the social and economic inequalities in our society, and we can only achieve that when we're independent. Neil Findlay. The Cabinet Secretary used to be a socialist. Um, in a quiet moment, a quiet moment like today, would he tell us, just us, nobody else, um, what his real view is of John Swinney's voodoo economics that will rip... 350 million a year out of public services and corporate tax cuts, a policy that would have a real detrimental impact on health and social policies uh, impacting on life expectancy. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, can I just say that one of the big campaigns in which Neil Finlay is involved is in campaigning to get rid of nuclear weapons from the Clyde, to quote him so that the resources could be freed up for reinvestment in education, health and uh, uh, helping poorer people in our society. Uh, the reality is, of course, that Neil Finlay is going to vote no, which means he is going to, despite his campaigning, is going to vote to retain nuclear weapons in the Clyde and spend the money, $100 billion, on nuclear weapons instead of on education yeah. and health and anti-poverty measures. So I don't think Mr Finlay can claim to be either consistent or indeed a socialist. Question number nine, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports the health of young transgender people before gender recognition is granted. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of young transgender patients getting the necessary support they require, and we expect all boards to ensure that the appropriate services are in place to help and support them. If he I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Will the Scottish Government give a commitment to consult NHS gender specialists and equality organisations to find out how the gender identities of young people can be recognised and supported? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, a great deal of discussion has been undertaken, particularly in the Equal Opportunities Commission, a Committee in the Parliament, in relation to this issue as part of our discussions on the passage of the a bill going through Parliament on same-sex marriage, which includes wide-ranging provision in terms of transgender services and support. Uh, we have been consulting the transgender community at every stage and we will continue to have dialogue with the transgender community to identify ways in which we can continue to support and help them, particularly at that stage in life, for example, young people in their teens and how they uh, manage uh, the situation that they find themselves in. Ten, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it expects a decision by the European Commission on the provisions of the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Scotland Act 2012 and what action it has taken in the interim to tackle alcohol abuse. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, we remain in dialogue with the European Commission and are committed to introducing mini minimum unit pricing. Minimum unit pricing is just one of over 40 measures in our Framework for Action document which seeks to reduce consumption, support families and communities, encourage more positive attitudes and positive choices, and to improve treatment and support services. Considerable progress has been made in implementing key aspects of the alcohol framework, including a record investment in tackling alcohol misuse of over £237 million in the last five years, delivery of over 366,000 alcohol brief interventions by NHS Scotland, the establishment of 30 alcohol and drug partnerships, development of an implementation plan to deliver the recommendations of the Quality Alcohol Treatment and Support Report, the commencement of the Alcohol Exeter Scotland Act, the passing of the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Act, and most recently, the launch last week of a campaign to promote the availability of a smaller wine measure in the on-trade. Jackson. Can Campbell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that comprehensive reply? Can I express frustration, if even he does not, at the length of time it is taking to secure support for the alcohol minimum pricing legislation? And can I ask him both 
why he's not pursued the offer of the industry to expedite a legal resolution of this matter in early course? And secondly, given that it's now 20 months since we passed that measure, why Parliament has not debated alcohol again since, given the very considerable cross-party support there was to pursue the agenda, and the very useful and constructive suggestions that came from Richard Simpson, many of which I think on all sides of this chamber we would prepare to explore and support. Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, I share the frustration at the time it is taking for us to be able to implement a legislation. There are two processes ongoing at the moment. One is in the domestic courts and indeed uh, within the next two weeks a further hearing on the action by the Scotch Whisky Association in relation to the implementation of minimum unit pricing. And I'm sure the member will understand if I do not go into the legal arguments as to why we have not responded positively to the proposal by the SWA. Uh, the other process is in the European community and the European Commission. There are three directorates involved in this question. The Internal Market Directorate, which is formally neutral on the issue, the Health Directorate, which is in favour of minimum unit pricing, and the Enterprise Directorate, who are, if not hostile, certainly not exactly pro. We believe the arguments being put forward by the Enterprise Directorate are entirely uh, without foundation. Uh, however, we do need to persuade the, the Commission, and in doing so, we have recruited the support of other governments, particularly the Estonian government, the Irish government, and indeed last week, although the minimum unit pricing won't apply in Denmark, nevertheless, the Danish government, the Danish health minister, is very supportive of what we are doing in Scotland. I should gently point out, of course, where we are an independent member state, I think we would have made substantially more progress than we've been able to do so far. Question number 11, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lancashire and what issues were discussed. Secretary. The ministers and government officials meet regularly with representatives of all NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Siobhan McMahon. I'm delighted to hear that, Cabinet Secretary. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether he has met directly with members of the NHS Lancashire Board, the expert team, or Health Improvement Scotland to specifically discuss the recent assessment of patient safety and quality of care within NHS Lanarkshire? Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, I asked the whole board to come to a meeting in St Andrew's House just before Christmas to discuss the report produced by Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I made it absolutely clear to the board that I expect them to take very seriously the findings of that report and to implement the recommendations of the report. I have given them till the end of March to make significant progress, and at the end of March, myself and my officials, along with Mr. Matheson, will be reviewing progress and deciding whether any further action is required on our part. Under Fabiani has asked for a supplementary, but can I say to the member, I'll take the supplementary after the next question. Question okay. number 12, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when ministers will next meet the board of NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, this will come as no surprise. <laughs> uh, both ministers and government officials meet regularly with representatives of all NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire. Mr McMahon. A very surprising answer, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, HIS gave 21 recommendations uh, to address the problems that were identified in NHS Lanarkshire. Some of the, the recommendations are quite vague and it makes it very difficult to establish what exactly the criteria will be to, to show that progress has been made in terms of improving uh, on, on these issues. For example, involving the staff and making them feel uh, part of the, the way forward. Will the Cabinet Secretary make known just what criteria will be set, what targets have been given to NHS Lanarkshire so that we know whether they're actually going to meet uh, the challenges that have been laid down to them by his Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, uh, both myself and my officials have been in dialogue with NHS Lanarkshire to spell out in no uncertain terms under each of the 21 recommendations and indeed other parts of the report not necessarily covered precisely by the specific recommendations to make it clear to them what progress we expect to be made by the end of March and beyond that how, how we expect them to get NHS Lanarkshire uh, into a better shape. And it has to be said, to be fair, uh, the NHS Lanarkshire, both the board and the senior management team, have taken on board both the recommendations and the comments within that report and in the subsequent discussions, the additional points that we have been making 
to them, uh, and I believe they are committed to implement all 21 of those recommendations to a high standard. Under Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can, can I say that Michael McMahon is quite right? Underneath the 21 recommendations and all that's going on in NHS Lanarkshire, there are a lot of staff who are doing an absolutely excellent job. And, and is the Cabinet Secretary aware that it was an NHS Lanarkshire initiative, um, the Integrated Community Support Team based in East Kilbride, which won the Older People Award at the 2013 Scottish Health Awards. And that's about providing more care at home um, in communities and trying to, to keep elderly people out of hospital or reduce their stay in hospital. This has been a great success with a great staff team. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister for Public Health would like to come along and visit the team in East Kilbride and see what great work has been carried out. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we're always glad to accept an invitation to East Kilbride. Uh, can I say that one of the frustrating things about the findings of the HIS report uh, in looking at the deficiencies within NHS Lanarkshire is that it, uh, in a way, distracts the attention from many of the good things that are going on in NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, the member refers to one particular service. Another one would be at Monklands Hospital itself, uh, where there is now a special dementia unit within accident and emergency, uh, a first of its kind in Scotland, indeed, I think the first of its kind in the whole of the UK. Uh, and it's a great pity that the deficiencies identified in this report are distracting public attention from the good things that are happening in NHS Lanarkshire. And we have to take a balanced point of view and a balanced approach. But having said that, the deficiencies are serious and they need to be sorted, and they need to be sorted ASAP. Question number 13, in the name of Christina McKelvey, has not been lodged. The member has provided an explanation. Question 14, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address reported increases in emergency emissions for people over 75. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the rate per thousand people aged over 75 admitted to hospital as an emergency had been rising for many years. That was one of the reasons we introduced a reshaping care for older people program and the £300 million change fund. Most recent data shows a levelling off of admission rates in Scotland. We are seeing impacts from the interventions we have made, such as intermediate care alternatives to emergency admission, Scottish Ambulance Service see and treat models, anticipatory care plans and key information systems, falls programme, carer support, unscheduled care action plan and local unscheduled care action plans. Bed days spent in hospital following an emergency admission are a better measure of how the whole system supports the rising number of older people with multiple and chronic illnesses. In the period from 2009-10, there has been a year-on-year -year reduction in the days spent in hospital following emergency admission per 1,000 people aged 75, a reduction of 9.5 per cent between 2009-10 and 2012-13. Well, Smith. The Cabinet Secretary is a very comprehensive and uh, good news story uh, from uh, the Scottish Government. Uh, could I ask, uh, notwithstanding the answer that you have uh, just provided, Cabinet Secretary, obviously there is an increasing proportion of those uh, in the post-75 age group who are going into accident and emergency with uh, dementia concerns. What steps are the Scottish Government taking to provide the specialist nursing uh, care that is required for these patients in acute hospital? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, under the dementia strategy, we now have a great deal of support uh, that wasn't there even a few years ago. We have dementia consultants, uh, we have dementia ambassadors, we have dementia champions playing different roles in different parts of the health service. Because although you're specifically, the question was specifically about acute care, clearly the relevance and the relationship between acute care and primary care is absolutely critically important. Over the next 20 years or so, the number of over 75-year-olds in Scotland will rise between 60 to 80 per cent. And very clearly, unless there is a cure found in the meantime, which is unlikely, 
then many of those patients are likely to have dementia. The total number of people with dementia in Scotland at the moment is 77,000. And if my memory serves me correctly, only 3,000 of those people are under 65 years of age. So by definition, 74,000 of those diagnosed are over 65, and a large proportion of them are over 75. So it is an area of priority, both in primary care services and in acute care services, and we are building on the dementia strategy to make sure that the complete panoply of services and support required for dementia patients is provided in each of our 38 acute and general hospitals. Question number 15, Rod Campbell. Ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to tackle the effects of excess sugar consumption. Minister. I'm aware of uh, recent reports in the media linking excessive sugar consumption with obesity, type 2 diabetes and a range of other conditions including heart disease and stroke. It is of course also linked to poor dental health. The Scottish Government is spending over £7.5 million in the three years to 2015 on projects to encourage healthy eating. These include the Healthy Living Award, the Healthy Living Programme, the Healthy Scotland Cooking Bus and the Community Food and Health Scotland Programme, alongside the Scottish Dietary Goals published by the Scottish Government uh, for average intake of added sugar to reduce it to less than 11 per cent of food energy in children and adults. Mr Campbell. I thank the Minister for his answer, but the Minister may be aware of research published in the British Medical Journal in October, which said that a 20% tax at a UK level on soft drinks with high sugar content would reduce the number of obese adults by around 1%. What consideration has the Scottish Government given to such measures, and what further steps can it take to reduce the health problems associated with excess sugar consumption? Minister. Um, I am aware that the uh, latest data from the uh, Cantor World Panel uh, uh, and data uh, shows that there has been a reduction in the volume um, of uh, soft drink sales by some 10 per cent since 2010, uh, although I do agree and recognise that there is much more that still has to be done. Uh, uh, Scottish ministers under current devolved powers are unable to create taxes on food uh, or drink uh, that with a higher fat or sugar content, uh, which is why uh, we have articulated in the uh, White Paper uh, on Scotland's future a desire uh, for the ability to consider the policy as part of a coherent and concerted approach to issues in tackling obesity and poor diet. In the meantime, though, uh, we are asking the food industry to take specific and voluntary action to help rebalance Scotland's diet. Uh, supporting Healthy Choices uh, voluntary framework will be launched in the spring uh, following a period of consultation. Uh, and the framework sets out voluntary actions for the food industry, including manufacturers, retailers and caterers, to encourage and to support consumers to make healthier choices. Question 16, John Lamont. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its strategy is for tackling ADHD among young people. Minister. Uh, children and young people with developmental uh, disorders will be treated by their local child and adolescent mental health services teams in the community. Uh, we have made a commitment in the mental health strategy to undertake work to develop appropriate specialist capacity in respect of developmental disorders such as ADHD, as well as improving awareness in general settings. As part of this work, we will review the need for specialist inpatient services within Scotland. Education authorities have a duty to identify, meet and keep under review the additional support needs of all their pupils and to tailor provision to their individual circumstances. If it could be brief, Mr Lamont. Yeah, I thank uh, the Minister for that response. The Minister will be aware of the high rate of use of ADHD drugs in the NHS borders area. It's 17.2% in 2012-13. It is the highest rate of any NHS board in Scotland. I accept that we have a use for these drugs and should be part of the range of treatment options available for ADHD. But is the Minister aware of the recent uh, NICE guidance, which has been recently reissued, which raises concerns about the use of these drugs and recommends that drugs should not be used in the first line of um, treatment for school-aged children and young people with moderate ADHD. And the British Medical Journal has recently raised similar concerns. Does the Minister accept that the use, uh, drug rate use in the borders is unusually high and does he believe that more should be done to reduce it? If this could be brief, Minister. 
Well, it's important that the member recognises that the type of clinical intervention that's provided for a patient is a matter for the clinicians uh, rather than for uh, government to direct. However, the same guidelines which apply here in Scotland rather than the NICE guidelines, um, uh, 112, uh, set out the details for uh, clinicians in the management of children with ADHD and other behavioural problems. And uh, they set out the criteria that should be used and how they should be uh, supported and how their uh, conditions should be appropriate. Met, but the overall decision about the final judgment on uh, the clinical provision is a matter for the clinicians themselves. Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 8857.